properties in terms of reflecting infrared light, and this is an infrared telescope. So that's why we choose gold. I think people want us to build this telescope because they want to know how we got here. I want to know how we got here. You know, we started the James Webb Telescope to look at the cosmos and the early universe. But we've discovered this so much more powerful that it can do new things. And we're seeing teams of people, led by women, taking that scientific direction somewhere else. Taking it to try and understand, could there possibly be life out there? Do you have any estimate for how many nights you spent up at the oh, Crocker Dome? Oh my gosh, between 2000 and 2003, we spent so many nights up here. And it's quite remote, right? I mean, that's the thing, there's no bathroom, right. there's no internet. There were so many creatures along this path. When I started in the late 1990s, we were trying to find planets using this small telescope up at Lick Observatory. We were using this new technique. It had never been done before, and people were very skeptical. In fact, the whole thing was built on a shoestring budget. But it was so compelling to work on a project that had the possibility of detecting an Earth-like planet in the future. I do remember this path. Yeah. The possible beginning. Oh, yeah. no, unfortunately, I don't have the key right now. Oh, so all of the inside. Come out. Yeah, there's nothing in there. It's just just uh, uh, some empty shelves. This is not the uh, astronomer's ideal uh, weather conditions. Isn't this a way to understand why we had to go to space? You know, to find planets, you need to stare unblinkingly. Uh, so besides the fact that the sun gets in our way sometimes, we have day, the weather does too. So no observations are going to be done tonight. You spent a lot of years up here like, looking for exoplanets. Did you find any? We found hundreds of periodic dimmings of light but none of them turned out to be bona fide planets. The analogy I'd like to use is to imagine a skyscraper, 80 stories high in New York City, and you've got all of these windows, and it's nighttime. All the windows are illuminated. And one person goes to one window and lowers the blinds by about a centimeter. That's the change in brightness we had to be able to detect. In the beginning, it was a lonely field. Very few planets were known. Months would go by and not a new planet would be discovered. Nevertheless, I knew the field would explode. And I'd say, look, I know there's gonna be so many planets transiting, we're not gonna be able to count them all. And they'd no, I don't, I don't believe it. And so they didn't believe it, they didn't hire me. And then came Kepler. Three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets like our The Kepler Space Telescope monitored one small section of the sky, and it found thousands of planets. Another Earth is undoubtedly out there. In our own Milky Way galaxy, we have hundreds of billions of stars. Our own universe has hundreds of billions of galaxies. To me, personally, it is definitely there. Oh, there you are. There you are. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. Hey, Natalie. We have a good group in the room today. All right. Well, the last few meetings, we've had one planet candidate in each batch. Yeah. We rely on a few core experts, and Natalie's one of them. Natalie was one of the leaders of the Kepler mission. Kepler was so pioneering, it opened our eyes for the first time. And Tess is now just finding objects around closer stars and smaller stars as well. Okay, the motion becomes transit. Well, how are you detecting these exoplanets? Well, nowadays, the best way to find planets is by the transit technique. If this represents our star, and this blue represents a planet, if you're lucky, the planet will orbit such that it passes in front of the star as seen from the telescope. Then the starlight drops by a tiny amount. Thousands of planets have been detected this way. They range from smaller than Earth size to Jupiter size. I leave should be this one this way. I like this one. Look how long the transit duration is too. Yeah, this one's also past century. We're hoping to find and identify the pool of transiting planets in the habitable zones of small stars. Let's keep it. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. The Goldilocks zone. On to the next one. That one looks great. One system that had two viable planet candidates that were very exciting. Yeah. Super. So you want to study these candidates with the James Webb Space Telescope? 
actually the question often comes up, how much time are we going to get for exoplanets? You know, if we find a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere in the habitable zone of an M star, do you have any idea how much telescope time we're going to need to look at that planet's atmosphere? Yeah, we have five to go, six. Yeah, let's kill it. kill it. Given that our own atmosphere contains thousands of gases, we expect alien atmospheres to also contain thousands of gases. And my job is to figure out how each one of those gases interacts with light. And some molecules, like oxygen, we send out into space, life does, but other things do too. Some molecules, like phosphine, only life sends out into the atmosphere. And so it's one of the reasons I'm so fond of it, because although it's rare and actually quite poisonous, only life makes it on Earth. And so it's an unequivocal sign of life. My generation, we're betting on the fact that nature delivers, that life can originate and evolve anywhere given the chance. And we're planning on finding it. There's no question. Same.